Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It's hard to believe that it's been 29 years, but it has. I was 12, and for the first time, I was being allowed to go deer hunting. This was meaningful, as I was now being considered a man in the family, someone who could put meat on the table, so to speak. The hunting trip took me to a 200-acre parcel my family owned in Wisconsin. There, I'd be hunting with my father, uncle, and cousins. I was no stranger to the property, as I pretty much spent every summer of my childhood there. My cousin was just as excited about my first deer hunting trip as I was. So, upon my arrival, he took me out to the woods to show me something unusual. He asked, Want to see something weird? I replied, Yeah. He picked up a big stick, swung and whacked a tree hard. He repeated this several times. I wasn't sure what he was doing until I heard a whack sound in the distance. At first, I thought it was an echo. He handed me the stick and told me to try. Like him, I whacked the tree several times, then waited. Just like before, I got a response far off in the wood. I'll admit, I didn't know what any of that meant, and in some ways, I thought it was kind of cool. My cousin then let out a yelp. Seconds later, something responded. Again, I didn't know what to think about any of what he'd showed me. And before long, we went back toward the cabin. I was fascinated by what could be responding to our wax and yelps. Unable to get the odd incident out of my mind, I went back out to the same spot later. I picked up the branch I'd used before, swung and whacked the tree. Like before, a response came back, but this time from a different part of the property and closer. When I think back, I don't ever recall hearing or knowing people who did tree knocks or vocalizations. It was apparent my cousin knew about it, but I was oblivious. Heck, I didn't even know what a Bigfoot was at that time. Confused. I brought it up to my uncle, who was a man of few words. He simply told me to stop knocking on trees and mumbled a name I wasn't familiar with. I shrugged it off and went about the rest of my day. What's odd is it wasn't until much later in my life did I hear that name again, this time from a prominent Bigfoot researcher, Kunbo Baker, that night, I was told where I'd be hunting. They were going to stick me way out at the far end of the property, a place I had been told to avoid before because of how remote it was and that I could get stuck back there due to the bogs and creeks. Looking back now, I do find it ironic I was stuck in the one place I was always told to stay away from. The morning came, and it was chilly. My uncle took me out and dropped me off. Before he left, he instructed me to stay put, and that he'd come to get me at the end of the day. I nodded and went on my way. This part of the 200 acres was much different than any other part. In fact, the whole atmosphere changed back there. It went from hardwoods to really thick brush, high grass, 
and, like I mentioned before, bogs and creeks. I went to an old willow tree, which held a rickety and aging tree stand. I put my foot on the first step, applied pressure, and sure enough, my first step broke. I thought to myself, great, in order for me to reach the second step, I'd have to go back, make a running jump for it. Being 12 has its disadvantages and height was one of them for me at the time. I took a few steps and went for it. I easily made the second step, although I was a bit nervous that it would break too, which would send me to the ground crashing hard. This old tree stand wasn't very sturdy to begin with, as they'd used what appeared to be any old scrap of wood. Using every ounce of caution, I scaled up and took a seat. Time ticked away, and a chill began to settle in me. Not a chill from fright, but because I had been motionless, like a good hunter should be. It was a cloudy day, and the warm rays of sun were being hidden. More time ticked away, and I knew I was doing a good job of being still. As every squirrel and bird came close, oblivious that I was even there, the sun crept toward the horizon. The day was getting away from me, yet I'd not seen a deer. I suspected the shooting hours had passed and that my uncle would show up at any time. Patiently, I waited, and waited, and waited. Dark wasn't far off, and still, my uncle hadn't come to get me. I grew concerned, and knew I had two choices. I could continue to wait, or get down and head back by myself. As I made up my mind on what to do, I took notice that everything around me had gotten very quiet. Fear suddenly took hold of me. I had felt it before in my life, but not to this level or intensity. My eyes darted around and looked for the squirrels or birds that had populated the woods around me all day, only to find that they had gone. I couldn't see anything around me, yet... I knew I wasn't alone, that something was out there. The fear kept rising, but why? I still hadn't seen anything. Regardless, my senses screamed at me to go, run, get out of there. I knew that something wasn't right, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. The sun was sinking and it was getting darker by the second, I now knew that no one was coming to get me, and that I was going to have to make a go of it on my own. I got ready to get out of the stand, then did everything you shouldn't do with a 30 30 lever action rifle when climbing out of a stand. I half-cocked the rifle because I knew I'd be most vulnerable and exposed as I climbed out of the stand and down the willow tree. I couldn't see much of anything around me, yet I couldn't shake this feeling that something was there close by. Slowly, I navigated down the tree, taking care with each foot placement until I reached the last step. From there, I planned on jumping. Without a second's hesitation, I leapt. I hit the ground and quickly recovered. I got up, and now I was facing down a path or what might have been an old deer trail. What little bit of light was left illuminated the open space in front of me. It was then I spotted something rise just off the trail to my right about 30 feet. It towered like nothing I'd ever seen before. I guess now that it stood over seven or maybe eight feet. 
My body tensed, and the fear that I thought was elevated already rose to almost sheer terror. Instinctually, I cocked the hammer fully back on the rifle and threw it onto my shoulder. Just as I did that, whatever this thing was raised one leg, stretched it out, and placed it on the opposite side of the trail. It now straddled both sides. Its massive frame focused on me and my rifle. I have to laugh now, because, believe it or not, I began to think about hunter safety. Know your target and beyond. My mind screamed at me for just a brief second before I hollered back. Know your target? I don't know what I'm even looking at. Whatever it was could only be described as massively tall, around seven to eight feet tall and wide, its shoulders spanning feet across the trail. The fading light of the day shined from behind it, making it impossible to make out good detail, but the outline was crystal clear. I made out that it was standing on two feet, had legs, arms, and a head. I could also make out hair or fur or whatever you want to call it. I thought to myself, what am I seeing with the butt of the rifle in my shoulder? I put the scope on it and looked through. My scope was low powered with a yellow filter, which illuminated everything a bit more, but still not enough to clearly make out what I was seeing. I placed the reticle of my scope on the vitals, placed my finger on the trigger and stood ready to unload everything if it made one move towards me, the entire time I thought that I was going to die. That this was it. I still couldn't make out any facial features of the creature because the light came from behind it. But I knew this thing could easily kill me. With all the slack taken out of the trigger, I was ready to fire. But it didn't move. Both of us were at a standstill, our gazes fixed on the other. I couldn't say how long we stood staring each other down, but it felt like forever. Then, without notice, it leapt to the right from where it stood. All I heard now was crashing as it fled. A minute later, there was silence. I then saw something farther down the trail. It was the silhouette of a deer. It dawned on me that I had come in between this thing and its meal. I assumed it must be mad at me, so I did the worst thing possible. I turned and ran. With each step, my heart pounded to the point I swore it would explode. My vision narrowed, which made it harder to get a good view. To my right, the direction the thing had gone, I heard movement. I now thought the thing was going to circle around and come for me. I got up, swung my rifle around, and again readied myself to fire. But nothing was there. Without wasting another second, I pivoted and raced off again down the trail. I don't know how long it took me. But I did finally make it back to camp. Not a second after my arrival, my uncle and everyone began to haze me. They could tell I had been spooked with someone joking that I looked like I'd seen a ghost. What they didn't know was I had seen something far worse. I asked my uncle why he hadn't come to get me, and he replied that he had tried but couldn't find me. I didn't know what to believe. All I knew was I was glad to have made it out of there alive, as I was sure my demise was certain. I rushed inside the cabin with my rifle, only to have my uncle remind me he didn't like weapons inside, only because he said they sweated from the change in temperature. 
I told him I would clean it and went inside. I wiped the rifle down and carefully hid it, loaded under my bed, and slid my sheath knife underneath my pillow. While I had made it back, I couldn't calm down and didn't feel safe. A large window overlooked my bed, and all I could imagine was awakening to that thing hovering over me just outside the thin panes of glass. I could see it crashing through the walls, taking hold of me, and, well, that would be it. Needless to say, I didn't sleep an hour that night. Come morning, everyone was up, and the last thing I wanted to do was go back out there. I hadn't told anyone what had happened, but they knew something was wrong. However, that didn't stop them from hazing or making fun of me. It's just what they did. I told my dad I didn't feel good, that I had gotten too cold the day before, so maybe I could take the stand closest to the cabin. My plan was to bag a deer as fast as I could and get the hell out of there. I knew this was my only way out. I arrived to my new stand, and believe it or not, I got a deer rather quickly. I was excited mainly because I could now head home. Then I was told there were more tags to fill, so I was to help drive deer to the others. My heart sank. I felt defeated and terrified because I'd have to be back out there. With my hands white-knuckled on my rifle, I walked through the wood. My head swiveled back and forth every time I heard a sound. With each crack of a branch or crunch of leaves, I snapped my head with the expectation of seeing a monster pop up, only to see a deer or squirrel. I made it through the drive, which ended the hunt. Hours later, we headed home. Looking back now, I think it's fair to say my life was on the line that day, and the one thing that saved me was my old 30 30 lever action rifle. I can still feel it angrily looking at me, both of us locked in a standoff with neither committed to act. I went back to the property a few years later, but I made sure I never went to that part of the property again. I figured that was his territory, and also figured he was probably still mad at me. As the years passed, I tried to convince myself that I hadn't really seen what I saw, that it all was the wild imagination of a 12-year-old. I dared never mention it to my family for fear they'd mock or ridicule me. So, I held in the fear from that day, never uttering a word to another until now. Even in my best effort to wipe my memory of that time or imagine it was something else, I always regressed. I don't think I'll ever forget that day. Like so many others I've heard tell their tale, it's something that becomes seared into your memory. I still venture back into the woods, but now I go with the knowledge there are creatures there that could do us considerable harm. When I go, I'm always armed. Whatever those things are, they know what a rifle is. And I believe they also know what it's capable of. My rifle saved me that day 29 years ago. I know this without question. I also know that on that day, there were two hunters in those woods. On to the next one. My wife and I were returning home on the interstate one night in December in the distance. As we were coming up a grade, we saw a semi on the shoulder with its flashers on. As we got closer, there was quite a bit of blood on the pavement and some pieces of debris from the truck like broken lenses and a mirror laying on the road. We were driving quite slowly as we were approaching the truck and had noticed something on the shoulder which we believed to be a bear or a moose. 
Suffice to say, it was something very large, and it appeared that it was what had collided with the truck up ahead. We pulled up on the truck and got out. Walking over to the cab, we saw the driver was still inside. I grabbed the side rail and jumped up on the fuel tank to check on the driver. He was sitting in the seat with his head in his hand, still behind the wheel of the truck. I tapped on the window and asked him if he was all right. It took him a few seconds to respond and he rolled down the window. I could see that he was in shock and didn't answer right away. About a minute later, while I was telling my wife to call the police, he said to me, I just crashed into a damn Bigfoot that was running across the road back there, chasing a doe. I said to him, you hit a what? He repeated himself, saying that he had just demolished the front of his truck, hitting a Bigfoot that was crossing the highway. I climbed down from the cab and walked to the front of the truck. The lights were still on, and the entire grill, front bumper, and hood was buckled inward. The left front fender and headlamp were demolished, and the truck was leaking water from what appeared to be the radiator. It was about ten minutes later when a trooper came roaring down the highway, and an ambulance soon followed. At this time, the driver still had not come out of the cab, he was sitting there in silence and holding his head in his hand. As the trooper drove up, we told him briefly what we knew and he jumped up to talk to the man. Moments later, the second ambulance came to the scene as well as another trooper. The driver was now out of the truck and talking. About 300 feet behind my truck, the animal was on the side of the road. My wife, Helena, stayed by our car while one of the troopers and I started walking back to it. He had his gun drawn and told me to stay behind him. He said that if the animal is still alive, it may jump and try to hurt us. The trooper had a powerful flashlight with an expandable beam. I was walking maybe 15 feet behind him as we approached the animal. As soon as his light hit it, I saw the blackened face of a gorilla-type beast with blood pouring out of its mouth. I actually saw one of its eyes blink and its hand move slightly. I knew immediately that this was no moose or anything else that is known to be in these woods. It was exactly as the driver had said. He had crashed into a Bigfoot with his truck. The trooper told me to go back and stand by the truck. As soon as I had reached the truck, he fired three rounds at point-blank range into the creature to put him down. A few minutes later, he took a report from us as to what the driver had told us. We overheard as well what the driver was saying to the ambulance crew and the other trooper. He said that he was fairly certain he was going to hit the deer and was trying all evasive maneuvers in a short period of time not to do so, saying that the trailer brake had locked up and the trailer had begun to swing wide when all of a sudden, the Bigfoot was now squarely in front of the truck and unavoidable. He said when he hit the beast, he wasn't wearing his seatbelt, and the impact caused him to fly forward, smashing the windshield with his forehead, which explained to me why he was sitting there in a daze holding his head. But thank God he wasn't cut or bleeding. As we were leaving, the ambulance crew was putting the man in the back of their vehicle. Helena and I took off. Now this is from Helena's perspective. I was asking Wilfredo what he had seen because I had stayed by the car. I saw the trooper fire the shot and had only heard the conversation. Wilfredo told me that it was a Bigfoot and it was still alive, but badly bleeding, which was why the trooper had decided to put it down. I said to Wilfredo that I couldn't wait to hear what the news reports would have to say about it the following day, but when the morning had come, there was nothing. We sat by the TV all day, waiting and waiting, and nothing at all was said. The next day, Wilfredo actually called the local news station 
and inquired about not hearing the story. They had said they knew nothing about any such story and asked Wilfredo what he had seen. Wilfredo must have spent 30 minutes on the phone with them recounting the entire story and the next day, again, nothing was heard or said on the news. Nothing was in the local papers the entire week. We both know what we had seen and heard and yet not a word was spoken about it. We thought that surely there would be great interest in such a story, but it was never told. On to the next story. This isn't a first-hand story, but rather one my grandpa told me. He's as honest as the day is long, so I believe it really happened. My dad said he believes it too. I think it took place sometime in the 1970s. My grandpa was a cattle rancher. He worked very hard all his life on a place he inherited from his dad, although he added greatly to it, buying acreage and building lots of fence and cattle shed. He ended up owning over 5,000 acres when all was said and done. That may sound like a lot of land, when you need a couple of hundred acres to support one cow, you can see that the more of that kind of land you own, the poorer you are. My dad inherited the ranch, but he hated ranching. He had trouble paying tax bills, and my mom wanted to live in town, so he ended up selling it for song and dance. Otherwise, I might have become a rancher myself instead of running a tire shop. I probably would have hated ranching eventually, as it's nothing but hard work, according to my dad, who started the shop I now own two states away from where he grew up on the ranch. So, go back to some time in the 1970s and picture my grandpa in his 40s, tall and a bit too thin, wearing his old, beat-up Stetson and run-down-at-the-heel Tony Lama cowboy boots, a blue plaid button-down shirt and faded Levi's, smoking an old gold cigarette while driving an old beater Chevy pickup he bought used from some old guy at the livestock auction over in Holbrook, on his way to fix a fence or repair a windmill. His blue Merle Aussie cattle dog, Joey, was always at his side day and night. If you've ever been to Holbrook, Arizona, you'll know why my dad hated ranching. That country is full of salt and poison that nothing much can grow on. It's some of the most barren country on the planet, not far from the petrified forest. It's hard to believe my grandpa made a go of ranching there, and I sometimes wonder how well off he might have been if he had decent conditions to work with as he was a smart and hard-working man. The key to raising cattle there was having water, as it's just barren desert. With water to drink, the cattle seem to wander and find enough to eat though one has to supplement their feed and then move them up into the higher country in the summer to get them out of the heat. My grandpa had some leased land over by Flagstaff where he would truck his cattle for the summer, fattening them up in the tall mountain grasses. But back to his ranch, which was called the Broken Stirrup Ranch. My grandpa spent a lot of his time running around checking on cattle and fixing fence, going from windmill to windmill making sure they were working okay, as cow or steer could die really fast without water. These big old windmills sucked water up from a deep aquifer, pumping it into big stock tanks, and it wasn't bad water. Of course, other animals would come and drink from the tank, usually at night, especially the antelope. But one time, my grandpa had a visitor that wasn't like anything the broken syrup had ever seen before, or probably since. I think he almost left the ranch over this, and he had been through many hard times, so that tells you something. My grandma was normally the type of person who saw the world as she wanted to, not as it really was, and would avoid anything out of the ordinary. Yet, she stood by this story her whole life. In fact, she eventually started going out with Grandpa while this all happened to be sure he wasn't alone. My grandma was a real homebody, 
so she must have been really worried to do this. So, one day, my grandpa was out checking this particular windmill, and he notices there aren't any cattle around, not a one, and Joey is whining his little head off. Now, this is unusual, as the cattle always come to the tank to hang out in the heat of the day, and they get in your way when you're trying to check things out. This worried my grandpa, so he started driving around the area looking for them. He would just take off cross-country, no road, and you can do that out in the Badlands as long as you watch where you're going. He got up on a rise, and no cattle were to be seen anywhere. He was especially worried because it was about the time to start calving. He finally spotted them clear over at the fence along the highway, all huddled up together as if they stampeded and couldn't get any further than the fence, but sure would like to leave the country. He checked on them, and they all seemed fine, but he was puzzled. They seemed glad to see him, and since he was supplementing their grazing at that time with hay, he had some bales in his pickup, and they followed him on back over to the windmill, hungry and thirsty. They seemed really leery, but they did finally come up and drink, but they were really spooked. He noted all of this, trying to figure out what had happened. Something had scared them, he knew that, and the way Joey was whining was odd. He never did that unless something was wrong. Grandpa threw the hay out, hung around a while to watch them, and finally left after everything seemed back to normal again. He noticed his rearview mirror that as soon as he left, they scattered, so he drove back. They hadn't begun to finish the hay, and when they saw him there, they came back and started eating again. This really puzzled him. They were still scared, but his presence seemed to make them less fearful. So he stuck around while they finished the hay and drank, checking the windmill and all that while waiting. Checking the windmill and all that while waiting. It was then he noticed some weird prints in the mud around the tank. Really weird prints like nothing he'd ever seen. Really big and wide and having five toes like a human. Joey was again whining, all upset, wanting to get back in the truck. Joey always rode in the cab with Grandpa, but since the doors were closed, he jumped into the bed and tried to hide. He never did ride in the bed. He was a dog of luxury, unlike other cow dogs. Grandpa tried to track the print, but they just disappeared when they crossed the nearby slick road outcropping. Joey wouldn't get out of the truck bed. He always went everywhere with Grandpa, but no way would he help him track. This made Grandpa worry too. Something was way wrong. He was afraid to try to look for tracks any further. This all really spooked my Grandpa, and he now understood why the cattle were so nervous. He got out his high-powered binoculars from the pickup and glassed the countryside all around, seeing nothing, and he could see for a long ways in that open country. Now my grandpa could smell something foul. It made him gag. Just then, a small herd of about eight antelope came running, hell-bent, up to where the cattle were kind of picking at the hay, still nervous. This caused the cattle to take off again, and the antelope stayed with them. This made my grandpa think the antelope were more afraid of something out there than they were of him and were seeking safety with the cattle. He stayed there for about an hour, watching, but saw nothing. Finally, he left, having things to do, but he later went back with more hay and enticed the cattle back to the tank. They were all thirsty and drank for a long time. The antelope were still with them. That evening, before going home for the day, my grandpa checked on the livestock again. They seemed happy, lolling around the tank, chewing their cud. Whatever it was, it was apparently gone. Next morning, he was back out there, bright and early, as he hadn't slept well, worrying about those tracks. Sure enough, no cattle. The entire scenario was repeated, and he finally got the cattle back over to the tank and settled down. The antelope had moved on. This time, he counted them to make sure they were all there, which they were. He was worried, 
that all this stress was bound to make them start calving early, and he didn't want that. What was he to do? Something was scaring his cattle, and what if it actually harmed one of them? This worried him. He had lived in Oregon for a couple of years as a kid when his dad had worked for the lumber mills there before moving to Arizona, and he knew, well, the stories of Bigfoot. That's exactly what the tracks had to be. Nothing else worked. But how in the heck could there be a Bigfoot on a dry Arizona ranch? How did it get there, and what did it eat? The latter question is what worried him the most. He went home midday, which he rarely did, and my grandmother knew something had to be wrong. He told her what was going on, and she freaked. She made sure he had his loaded rifle with him, and as I said earlier, she eventually started riding in the truck with him until this was all over. They talked about what to do, and my grandma was pretty firm about my grandpa having to somehow get rid of whatever it was as it was disturbing the cattle. So my grandma hopped in the pickup with Gramps and Joey and off they went. She had her Polaroid camera and wanted to see the track, which she did, and that really freaked her out because it confirmed that Grandpa wasn't seeing things. I still have those old photos, but they're so faded you can't make out much. Grandpa knew that another sleepless night was on its way, so he decided he might as well spend it out watching the cattle. Grandma didn't like this one bit, but Gramp did it anyways, spending the night at the tank, sleeping in his truck with one eye open and a rifle in his hand. Joey curled up by his side. Nothing happened. Morning came and all was fine, so he went home and got some sleep. He and Grandma returned in the afternoon. Everything was still A-OK. -okay. Now, Grandma wasn't the kind of person to just stand by and let her livelihood be compromised, so she did something that Grandpa was at first upset about, but later decided it was a good idea. She talked to the neighbors, what there were anyways, out in the middle of nowhere. She then called their friend at the Bob Wire Ranch over by Flagstaff and asked if they had any weird goings on. Come to find out, they had, which I think surprised her. They too had seen strange things, but they had a regular crew of hired men and had put out night guards, and eventually, whatever it was, left. Not until it had killed and partly eaten a yearling calf. They had actually seen it in the dark and shot at it, and this is when it finally got the message and left. She thanked them for sending it her way and invited everyone over to help stand night guard, which they said they would be happy to do if she and Grandpa needed help. But not until after calving. She said she would get back to them after talking to Gramps. Gramps was now very concerned after hearing the thing had eaten a calf. He was beside himself. He couldn't stay up all night guarding and also run a cattle ranch. He would die of exhaustion. He was already sleep deprived and grouchy. What to do? All he could think to do was to go out and check on everyone. This time he drove on past his gate to the stretch by the highway where the cattle always ended up. He might as well go with the flow. Sure enough, there they were, bellowing and milling around as if someone had just stampeded them. All of a sudden, Joey went ballistic, barking at something on the crest of the hill, and that's when Grandpa saw it for the first time. It wasn't at all what he'd been looking for as it wasn't black, but a reddish tan color that blended right into the hills. Maybe this thing wasn't a newcomer at all, but part of a line that it adapted to the desert, seeing how well it blended in and all. This really bothered him, so much so that he immediately jumped out of his truck and started shooting at it, even though it was a good half mile away. He hadn't shot that rifle for a good five years or more. It ran like the wind before he got a chance to get out his binoculars and take a good look at it. But, in all honesty, he was more interested in shooting it. He could look at it when it was a goner. But, he had an unsettled feeling, even though he couldn't see it very well. It looked too much like a human, bigger and faster than any human, but still very much like a human. It was then he noticed 
he'd left his truck right in the highway and a semi was coming up from the road. So he jumped in and managed to get it to the side of the road before disaster hit. This made him feel like a fool, which led to his cussing the Bigfoot to no end, wishing it were back in hell where he figured it belonged. He hadn't seen it well enough to be traumatized by it, but his time would come even though he had no inkling of it at this time. There was no way he was going to get the cattle back over to the tank, so he turned around and went home. He needed help. So, Grandma again called the boys at the bob wire. They weren't sure what to do, as they were in the thick of the start of calving season, but offered again to come help when things slowed down. Grandma was now expressing her interest in coming up there and giving them a piece of her mind when one of the guys had an idea. Why didn't Grandpa just get a camp trailer and stay out with the cattle until things settled down? The bob wire had had good success with someone staying with the cattle, and things had mellowed out a bunch after they did that. Grandpa wasn't too happy about this, as he didn't have the money for a camp trailer, but Grandma soon had it all figured out. She called the Fitzgerald Garcia Sheep Ranch and borrowed a sheep wagon and... All they had to do was go and get it. Grandpa was now frustrated with Grandma. He didn't want anything to do with sheep. He was a cattle rancher. He didn't even want to sleep in a wagon that was called a sheep wagon. But Grandma prevailed and the wagon was soon set up next to the tank, all outfitted with coffee and supplies. Grandpa would spend his first night there that very night. Grandma worried about him, but he convinced her nothing could happen while he was locked up in a tin can. He was about to find out how wrong he was. That night, he camped out by the tank. He kind of enjoyed it, building a big fire and sitting there watching the stars and reminiscing about his youth when he ran cattle for the bob wire, which is where he cut his teeth in the business. He then got to wondering what his life would have been like if he'd done something different, like maybe open a tire shop. The cattle were happy to have him there and they all hung around close by as if seeking his security and guard. He could hear them lowing contently, and before he knew it, he was fast asleep. His head on a small log and his feet to the fire, which he had banked with a couple of large logs from his autumn forays in the mountains. His plan was to sleep in the sheep wagon, but he never got that far. He was just too tired. Joey was, of course, with him, a good dog sleeping at his master's feet. He adored Grandpa, and they were an inseparable pair. Sometime in the middle of the night, Joey woke Grandpa, growling in a voice he had never heard before. The cattle were restless, and even though it took Grandpa a minute to remember where he was, he lost no time. His trusty rifle was at his side, and he quickly grabbed it up and got himself and Joey into the sheep wagon where they could assess things with some safety. Now, he could hear the cattle making all kinds of noise, and he knew the creature had to be nearby. He stepped out of the wagon and fired a few shots into the air, which was all it took to stampede the cattle. There they went again, off the fence line by the highway. Nothing he could do about that except follow to make sure they were okay. He was getting damn tired of all this and just wanted a good night's sleep, nothing more. He was collecting a few things to take with him, a thermos of coffee and a jacket, when he felt something slam against the side of the sheep wagon so hard he thought maybe he'd left the truck out of gear and it had rolled into it. He looked out the side window, but there was no truck there. Whatever it was had hit the wagon so hard it had actually tipped a bit, which made Grandpa pretty uncomfortable. Joey was barking madly again, but after a few moments, he disappeared under Grandpa's sleeping bag in the bunk, hiding as quiet as a mouse. This was totally unlike the bulldog who had once chased a black bear from camp up in the San Francisco mountain. Grandpa stood there for a bit, scared stiff, with Joey bravely under the covers, wondering what next. After a while, he figured he needed to get out and check on the cattle. As he finally worked up the courage to get out of the wagon and into his truck, he heard the most blood-curdling scream imaginable from the distance. It made his blood run cold, and he never forgot it. Joey, who apparently hadn't planned on going anywhere 
except under the covers, came running out of the wagon and jumped into the truck, shaking like a leaf, trying to actually get under the truck seat. Grandpa felt sorry for him and put his coat over him so he felt safe. Then, hightailed it out of there, going back over the highway to check on everyone. By now, Grandpa was totally exhausted and scared to death. It seemed to him that the Bigfoot had left for now and the cattle were okay, so he drove on home, leaving the cattle to fret in their corner by the fence. Of course, when he related everything to Grandma, she was soon on the phone again to the Bob Wire boys, making them feel more than guilty for running that damn monster over their way. They promised they would send two guys over to help that night. They were good on their promise, sending two cowboys over who stayed in the sheep wagon and took turns guarding the cattle. Grandpa finally got some sleep. They reported all was well and the cattle had started their calving that very night. Seems like they had waited for everything to settle down to have their babies, which cattle have been known to do. With the help of the Bob Wire boys, Grandpa was finally able to get everything under control, and the Bigfoot seemed to know what was up because it stayed away the entire time they were around, which ended up being several weeks. With calving finally over, Grandpa moved into the sheep wagon for a couple of weeks, watching the calves at night and making sure everything was okay. The Bigfoot was still gone, but Grandpa decided to haul the cattle a bit early to his mountain land as it was shaping up to be a nice mild spring and he didn't want to risk losing any calves to the beast. He somehow knew in his heart it would be back. The Bob Wire boys came down and helped him load everyone up in the cattle truck and they were soon on their way up the mountain. Every year after that, Grandpa hired them to come down from Flag and help out. I guess he realized that there was a limit on what one man could do. Fast forward to midsummer, the cattle were happily grazing in the high country, and Grandpa was out at a tank working on windmill maintenance. All was well until he noticed that Joey had his hackles up. The dog then jumped into the truck, shaking. Grandpa looked where Joey had been looking and saw the creature over in the shade of an old abandoned shack. He could now see it clearly. The top of its head was cone-shaped, and it had long hair on its head that came down to its shoulders on both sides, covering part of its face. It seemed to not have any neck, but the head just kind of melted into the shoulder. Its body hair was shorter and very unkempt looking. He could make out a closed mouth, a flat nose, a heavy brow line, and the eyes were all dark with no white showing. Its face was like an aborigine. After seeing it, Grandpa said he could never shoot one. They were too human. At first, Grandpa was scared to death, and he started to make his way over to the truck and his rifle, but then he noticed the creature seemed to be having trouble standing up, as if it were dizzy or something. Then it dawned on Grandpa that all it wanted was water, just a little drink of water. So he got into the truck and drove off a ways, then just sat there watching. I can say he had more nerve than I would have had to stick around, but he was always a curious kind of guy. Sure enough, it was dying of thirst. It barely managed to drag itself over to the tank where it then actually climbed into the water drinking while sitting in the tank. That tank was several feet deep and Grandpa said the Bigfoot must have been at least eight feet tall to stick up as much as it did when sitting in there. After it seemed to get enough to drink, it just sat there looking at Gramp and Gramp said it just seemed to look right into his soul. It scared him to death and yet, he knew it wouldn't hurt him. It seemed to be able to tell Gramps thought. At least that's how he felt. It really creeped him out, so he threw his lunch out the window for it and drove away. It was pretty scrawny looking. The very next day, Gramps had to go to Flag for some salt and supplies. He came upon a road, killed deer, and had a light bulb moment. He had a small winch in the back of his pickup for pulling bales of hay into the bed and he stopped and hooked the dead deer up and hauled it into the back of his pickup. He said people were giving him strange looks as they drove by, so at one point he pointed to the deer 
and rubbed his tummy, which gave him a good laugh, knowing those travelers would think he was going to have that dead roadkill deer for dinner. He was always a character. This was an idea along the lines of how he always came up with things spur of the moment and pretty crazy, but they usually worked out. So he took that deer back to the tank and dropped it off back where the tracks had led to the area, hoping it would give the Bigfoot something to eat. He checked a few days later, and sure enough, the deer was gone. He hadn't seen the creature any more after that, but he knew it had come into the tank area a few more times for water as he saw some fresh tracks. He told my dad he thought it had left the area for good as soon as it had the strength because nobody ever saw it again and it never bothered any livestock. Until he passed away, Grandpa always told people about how he saved a Bigfoot's life after he first tried to shoot it. He always got a kick out of their reactions as he knew they all thought he was a liar, but then he would pull out an old photo he took of it while it was sitting in the tank as he had happened to have Grandma's old Polaroid camera on him. Their tune would change to shock and amazement, then they would accuse him of staging it with a guy in a suit. This provided endless entertainment for Gramps through the years. Too bad he never did anything to try and save that photo, because it eventually faded out and was gone. I personally think it would have done a lot for the science of Bigfoot, as well as making him a rich man. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!